Time. So it's really a pleasure uh, for me to welcome you here. Um, good at the LRP talks. And uh, we would like to start maybe with a quick uh, summary of how you got into photography. Um, I was working in a clothes shop in Bournemouth and had a really, really, I have to say, quite boring job, unfortunately. And um, I had a girlfriend at the time who I think really liked the idea of going out with a photographer. And on my 21st birthday, I was given, thankfully, by my parents, um, the ticket out of that miserable job, um, which was a SLR camera. And the, the, within fairly short thrift, I could see that this was really was my ticket. And I did a night class in Shelley Park with a really inspirational uh, teacher called John Ralph. And from there, applied, put a portfolio together and applied to Plymouth College of Art and Design and got onto just the two year uh, national diploma course there. So very, very, just an A-level equivalent kind of course, but it was enough to really, really push me out there. And um, I, 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 you know, that, that was so long ago. Mm -hmm. but so, so much has happened since then you know and, and I, I did the two-year course down in Plymouth but I actually I, I did, had a couple of jobs I did some work experience at the BBC in London and then had a, got a job there for a little while with a photographic unit but actually stayed in Plymouth ended up staying in Plymouth and uh, getting a job as a technician at the art college which was like an apprenticeship in loads of ways I was handling loads of different old, old Hasselblads and brown colour gear and darkroom equipment and then as a technician mixing up the chemistry and you know ID11 and D76 and C41 and E6 I know and that stuff, all, yeah. all that stuff that we you know we, we used to know much more than we do now maybe and and working in the darkroom mixing up all the chemistry for that too and it really um, gave me a really good grounding and I learned a huge amount from all the mistakes that students made so I, I was helping them, maybe helping them, but also also learning about what they were doing and how they were doing it. And then also um, uh, it came to be that uh, I, I started contributing to sort of local magazines. R rave music and club culture had just exploded across the UK in a very fortuitous sort of piece of timing. And with that came subject matter. And, and, and I, I was really inside that scene and you know, I think motivated by not wanting to pay to get in anymore mm -hmm. and just being able to be right in the front of the action. I wasn't never going to be a DJ or an MC, but I could be there taking pictures, you know, and that to document that scene and just to be there with cameras and just to enjoy it from a different perspective than the raver, I suppose, was uh, a motivating factor to start shooting really regularly and then contributing those pictures to publications, both locally and then nationally and it really blossomed from there you know mm -hmm. I, I could i could rant about this for the whole for, for the whole talk i really mm -hmm. could because it was really formative for me and just the experience of starting to get published and how one does that and i i used to there was this incredibly cool you know we're, we're here in east london and there, there, there was this was like the epicenter of cool for a bit and i i, I live 200 miles away you know, so I was in no way connected with this, and it seemed otherworldly to me, pre-internet. You know, <laughs> yeah, it's probably worth pointing out. So, if you wanted to immerse yourself in culture in somewhere like Plymouth, you could only do that by either going to clubs in London or um, magazines. You know, which were quite vibrant. There was quite a lot of magazines. You know, where you could pick this stuff up, and there was an incredibly cool magazine based very near here called Sleaze Nation. And I, I somehow, somehow, via PYMCA, which was their picture library, I, I started contributing pictures to them. Then they asked me, would I, like, if, if I'm bringing a roll of black and white to a nightclub ever, could you start, could I start shooting some stuff that might, would fit on their pages? They had the coolest pages. Mm. And, the own, and, and what I would do would be send them rolls of film, unprocessed, to send them the film. They would develop them. And if there was anything on there they liked, they would use it and I'd get 25 quid, you know. <laughs> but as I soon learned, you know, that 25 quid didn't count for anything. It was about getting a page in this magazine. Mm -hmm. And the only way I'd find out if I had a page would be to go down there and wait for it to be on the shelves in WH Smith and flick to the clubbing section. And 
one of the greatest, most motivating, sort of stimulating things that ever happened to me was that one week, one month, sorry, I got the opening image for the club section, which was called Savoir Vivre. And it was two naked men in the, on the, uh, in the sea uh, in Brighton, on, the Bright, on Brighton Beach, where I'd, I'd been out for a night and just still had my camera with me. Um, and these two blokes stripped off, ran into the sea, and I shouted out to them, and they, uh, you'll probably find it somewhere on my website. And, uh, you know, and, and I had a photo of two naked blokes, you know, and um, it was really joyous image, but that it should be selected for this page. The rush of excitement and just absolute kind of ownership O o over this thing that, that I created, you know, and that they had seen and chosen and utilized for something that was so cool um, was immediately, you know, th th this is kind of three or four years maybe into photographing, maybe five years into, uh, you know, photography for me, but that, that suddenly it really clicked that this was it, you know, mm -hmm. this is what I wanted to do and to chase like editorial opportunities and to get in magazines and to permanently sort of chase that feeling of like, there's my picture. Mm. And that, you know, has really driven and, and getting access through in, in that way has been a big driver for me. Yeah. Would you, would you consider yourself being self-taught? No, not well. Mm. Um, I did a really good, I can't take credit for that. No, I, I did two courses that were really, really helpful. I think, you know, what, once you've locked the technical bit, everything else is about knowing the industry, isn't it? Mm. You know, it, that, 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 that's what we self-teach, I think, that, that, and learn through only through our mistakes, you know. Mm. So um, I can't claim credit for that, really, because I did do a fantastic course in Plymouth, that, and I'm still really strongly connected to Plymouth College of Art, PCA, down there. And weirdly, I... <laughs> Weirdly, I um, did a, sort of took part in a promotional campaign from them uh, with, for them with them as uh, one of their successes, I suppose. And with another fantastic photographer, uh, Suki Danda, and a, and a few other names that have kind of um, uh, gone to Plymouth. And some friends of mine drove past the college, and they've got this really big wall there. There's an enormous picture of me mm. on, on on here, <laughs> which is so weird. And and some people were driving past it and just went, "There's Tom." Um, so I'm very proud of my association with them and mm -hmm. I had a good few years down there, so yeah. Oh, super, really, yeah, yeah. It's interesting, like before the, before the, um, we start the talk, we, uh, we had a really interesting, really engaging conversation really about how it actually is um, to start your career in the, uh, like pre-internet and also maybe pre-digital, yeah. And that also ultimately, it's maybe not such an incredibly important thing. In the end, you, li you live in the time um, that you do and, mm -hmm. you know, you have to make do basically like with the resources um, that are being given to you and yeah. that are available to you, I think. So the, I would like to know a little bit about the, what you think is the relationship between personal work and commissioned work. Um, mm -hmm. Like from our mm. students from the um, LRP, a lot of students at the beginning think you become a successful photographer, well, like you, basically just by getting, by being approached by amazing clients and then it grows from there. But the experience can be quite different. Yeah. Mm. Um, it's, it's passion driven, this is, isn't it? We, we, we don't get into photography because we think we're going to make loads of money. You know, it, we, we get into photography because we have to, you know. But, in the early days, loads of people would ask me, like, how do I get into, how do I get into music photography? And it's like, go and shoot music, yeah. you know. And I found, I found that quite weird, you know, that if you wanted to be into music photography, you'd already be doing it. You know, you'd be at the front of the queue to be at the front of the gig with your camera. And just because you haven't got pit access, it can be better to be behind the railing with a, mm. behind the front barrier with a camera, you know. So I really think it... Um, Uh, we, the, the, our motivations for getting into it are, are, don't, don't, don't tend to be about fame and glory and, and money. It's just because we have to. Mm. Um, for me, uh, I you know, like like I said, I, I, I really, really wanted to shoot, shoot shoot music, and I wanted the access and fought to get that, and, and, and that, that that was a really big driver. And, but but to your question about uh, how personal work 
kind of and, and the relationship with commercial work. Um, I think that was your question, wasn't it? I keep, yeah. well, I keep meandering. Yeah. I will meander off. So do that's drag exactly me back the here. question. No, no, that's that's it. Yeah. Sorry. So the the fact that <laughs> that the that the personal work actually drives your yeah. commissions. The, 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 I mean, you know, there there isn't even really personal work is quite a weird term in lots of ways because. It, that, it's just work, really, isn't it? It's the commercial work that's sort of the weird element of it. And we all should be generating our own projects and putting them out there. And I certainly maintain that really, really regularly of trying to put out in different ways um, my, where my passion is. And my passion is where my aesthetic is in that moment. And that aesthetic drives what, what subject matter as well. And for me, it um, is a really important aspect of telling people where you're at via the medium of a new project. So I really try to, you know, I've said that, I, I, I really, really try to maintain that and put a lot of effort and energy and my own money into projects because um, that you, you, can't, you, you have to rob Peter to pay Paul. You, 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 you really, really do. It's fine saying yes to commercial work, but you've got to invest in yourself and your own practice because if I just if I just did jobs, it would be um, an incredibly sort of bore, not boring, mm -hmm. but like not, and I don't mean that with editorial work. I love editorial work, but commercial jobs sometimes aren't where your heart is at. You know, mm -hmm. you're just doing it for money, and that, that it would. It, I, I just don't think photography should be uh, defined by just your commercial practice. Mm -hmm. You know, you, yeah. you've got to maintain that other side with energy. You know? Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess. In your personal work, you can be as uncompromising as possible. Absolutely. No, you know, there's no clients who wants to, you need to compromise for, uh, that you need to, who has different ideas. Yeah. Everything can look exactly yeah. the way you like. Yeah. And that is so you, that's, that's almost like the only opportunity I feel to actually produce like your very best. It's only if there's only one person charged and that's going to be you. Yeah. 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 It would be really great to have a look maybe at uh, a few of your, of your, of your personal work. So we had a look at, um, um, at Mordor at the beginning. Yeah. Elmador, yeah. yeah. This would be Try really great if you could maybe talk us through this. So Elmador was motivated like a real lot of my projects um, by a friend who um, I kept seeing on his Instagram post that he was hanging out with these incredible physique mod uh, not models, uh, athletes. And it always seemed to be in Iceland. So I messaged him all about it and said, like, what are you doing and how come and where and why? And he's a coach. His name's John Christian Singleton. He's an old family friend and he now coaches CrossFit. I don't know if your audience has already assessed this, but I am not of the gym. Mm. And um, God love all the people that are, but it's not my natural habitat by any means. So I have a real curiosity there. And I really want to know, you know and, and there's several of my projects that come about like that. I just want to know what it's like, you know. So um, he said, well, why don't you come to Iceland and see? And he set up some shoots. And to document this absolute alien world, um, with, with, uh, to photograph people's, it's really easy to photograph people's passion. If it, once they're inside what they're doing, I find it really easy, you know, and especially if it's particularly alien to me. And I went over and he just, it became this project about, called Elmador, which is an old Icelandic word, which doesn't have a direct translation, but it means the fire within. And for some reason, Icelandic athletes have this incredible fire within them that enables them to push so much harder. And even though it's a really small island with a small population, obviously, as we know, it has a really long winter, a very deep winter. And people, um, I think, use the gym as a way of escaping depression there. And so they're, you know, very healthy, strong, fit appreciators of the outdoors. And it was a real joy for me to be over there and just photograph some of these incredible athletes. And um, they, they constantly score really, really high podium places at the CrossFit Games. And like I said, people with passion, very easy to shoot. So I was really interested in the kind of textures and the exercises that they do, the, the impact on their incredible physiques and some of the, just some of the motivators that they, they, they have for doing what they do. And we, um, so we, we, we'd sort of follow them on their practice. And this is a, you know, obviously a, I think I think this is actually about ten in the morning, but it mm. looks about six or seven. You know, <laughs> but it's got sort of sun up in winter in Iceland. 
where they um, where they go training and they go training in these freezing cold conditions. There's a particularly relevant shot um, to that coming up. This is the water. This one here, where this is November, and um, Thury and Solveig here are about to swim in that sort of icy pool. You can see, and you can see the trepidation on their on their on their faces there and their physique that they're about to swim in this water, not for the practice of swimming, but just to take the pain. Mm. And they do they do it. You know, you can see what they're wearing. I'd, I'd be in a wetsuit and a dry suit and. But, 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 but they're going in to swim in freezing cold water just so that that ability to absorb and take pain will affect their gym practice so they can push harder in the gym. And like wow. I said, for the third time, it is so alien that yeah. as a concept to me because mm. my body says, well, my, my, my motto in life has been no pain, no pain. Mm. <laughs> um, but, you know, not for these guys. So... Um, it, it, it led to a really nice project um, that I was really, really satisfied with. And we met a great many incredible characters in incredible scenes. And that, that, that you know, I, 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 could, I, could almost, I could obviously just go on forever about this because, again, I, 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 I really, really love it. We had, we had some really beautiful films made, um, which I was really, really lucky with, just some one-minute uh, Instagram films. And it's really worth a look. And I, I was also really lucky because um, GF Smith in central London, the paper company, had a photographic um, arm to their business. And they, we exhibited this in this beautiful show space that they have downstairs in the showroom. And we printed and had a, printed the images really big, projected the films, had posters, and had a lovely launch night. And I really, really try to mark all of my projects with an event like this. It doesn't have to be an exhibition, but some kind of quirk or opportunity to see the work that isn't just on Instagram or a website, really. So that you should come out of the house and um, take part in something, you know. And, and, and also, really importantly, to give things away and just to say thank you to people that are coming. So we have lovely posters there. Yeah, yeah. And I've done, I've, I've done a few little different things like that and always try to incorporate an element um, yeah. Could I, could, I, could I ask when, when was it launched, the project? Um, I really should know the answer to that. I think it was 2018. Mm -hmm. So Elmer Thought Show Space, 2018, yeah. Mm, super yeah because i was wondering when 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 you said like uh like video motion pieces yeah. instagram that sounds very very now mm. yeah 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 did you did you do were you involved in the direction of the of the motion pieces no or? um mm. what i i know my forte and i was involved in the shape of the edit but not in actual the direction of shooting because I was very much focused on the stills, mm. very much. But I invited some people to come with me and shoot it, and they readily accepted. And that, that, that was a really um, uh, nice opportunity for them and for me as well, just to, mm. just to have like incredibly talented filmmakers with us. So uh, that you, 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 you can see all of that on, uh, mm. online. Yeah, super. And the, uh, how long did you, did you stay in Iceland? Oh, I, we did I, did. I did two shoots there in total, and only sort of four or five days at a time, mm. but, but busy days, mm. you know. And the athletes uh, were incredibly generous. We went and, and with their time, but we always share the pictures, you know. And they, they 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 need content, so I've no qualms about sort of sharing the work really immediately and mm. making sure that the quid pro quo is respected. Yeah, yeah. And they were. This is pure personal work or was it commissioned yeah. by someone no no not at all it you was pure curiosity it, yeah. it, 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 it was all curiosity based you know yeah. so uh that um is just I, I i i'm sure everyone's the same really but if i have an idea it's just an itch that i have to scratch mm. and I, i have very few ideas that i don't kind of deliver on you know mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. i have to like honor those ideas and for better or worse, you know, so, so, some things I do tank, mm. and but uh, other things, you know, really stick around and have an impact. Like this one, mm. um, this was around the time uh, that I, 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 so I shot this on Hasselblad and on Hasselblad Digital, and Hasselblad around that time said to me, you know, we, we're, we're bringing out the H60, we'd love you to shoot the campaign. I was like, well, I've just been shooting this stuff in Iceland, and Hasselblad are Swedish, and they said, well, we, we'd love you to shoot some. Could you come to Sweden and do some? Mm. And 
And I was like, yes, I can. And, and that, that was, you know, a, a really key element to shooting projects, I think, is that you don't know where they're going to end up. And, and like I said, some things I've done have tanked, but there's some interesting aspect will occur that will veer off in that direction. Mm. And you never know when you start a project where, what that's going to be and how it's, where it's going to shape and how it's going to shape up. And it's really important, I think, for all of us to say yes to things and see where it leads us. Mm. Because you meet people, you work with them, and so many avenues open up when you're doing work, mm. when you're creating work. And we don't always can have control over where it might end up, you know. But mm. um, saying yes to things has really, really uh, some un very, I had some very unexpected eventualities, you know. Yeah. Well, absolutely. I mean, whatever you do, you need to give it your full commitment. You yeah. just never know what's going to happen in the end. Yeah. And uh, so how did the collaboration with Hasselblad work in the end? So did they give you like a particular brief? Do you even have some images on your, on your webpage? Um, do I? I should do, shouldn't I? I really should do. No, I don't think I do. That's not very good, is it? Ah, well. Let me let me uh, let me just load this up. We'll see. This is my home page on my website. There's, oh yeah, here we go. So this is some of the campaign images. So from from the H60 launch for Hasselblad, that was um, that image was blown up about 30 foot by 20 foot at the photography mm. show, and it's just. You know, I, I really, really love it. It's it, it's really beautiful, and the, and the, the, the detail and image in this, the detail in this image is really incredible. And these were these are some astonishing Swedish crossfit athletes, and th there's a little film about it here mm. as well, with me uh, doing that thing. So, um, Hasselblad have been really, really good to me, and they also, I believe, make the best camera in the world. So it's not exactly a hard sell to. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> recommend working with them you know I, I it, they, they've been really good to me yeah mm. and the the other uh, personal project I'd like to talk to you about mm. is um, it's called on off oh yeah could you can you talk about this yeah, one yeah, a bit? yeah. well go, go, going back to where I was um, in those sort of uh, com coming from dance music and rave and what have you um, I didn't go freelance until I was 29 so I don't want to say that I was a late developer because that sounds like a cheesy mm. photography joke, doesn't it? But I don't mean that. Um, but I was quite late to it. So um, I was doing a lot of work then in my early 30s in sort of music and nightclubs and what have you. And I realized it wasn't really a sustainable. I didn't want to be the sort of chubby dad at the disco for, mm. forever, you know, yeah. it had sort of sadness written all over it. So um, I thought, I can't, I can't do that. So I will... Um, I want to transition into portraiture. And I was doing this thing for a magazine called The Fly, which has sadly now departed, but I had incredible access through shooting for The Fly. And we did this double page feature called um, Before and After, it was called then. And we used to photograph fans before and after they went on stage to document the sort of energy exchange that occurred during performance, really. And it's a very, very private and intimate space, the seconds before a gig and the seconds after a gig. And we'd have the same light set up, exactly the same position, and we'd get them on the way to the stage and on the way off. Um, the, a really successful example of that is uh, the, the Prodigy here, which was at the um, festival this was photographed. So um, we would uh, get in, uh, we, we ended up partnering this project with Warchild, the charity who fundraised within music. So. What that enabled us to do is get great access to some brilliant names. Um, and we would stand in position waiting to get, hopefully have people say yes. Mm -hmm. And come, you know, and we, lit, we, we stood there with a soft box. We always put the same white sheet up, the same mm -hmm. soft box, the same exposure and try to keep the whole thing really, really consistent, the aesthetic mm -hmm. of it, mm -hmm. so that it was a live music project, but was a portrait project. Mm -hmm. And it really, really helped. We, we had a massive launch for it because it became a fundraising book and print sales where lots of the artists signed prints and they, they, they were kind of auctioned. Uh, and we, we, it did really, really well. And there was a beautiful book created with it, all, all for Warchild, 
and a huge amount of press as well, with mm. big coverage in, at Enemy and the Independent, lo lots of great places. Um, and it kind of propelled me into the world of portraiture, I felt, mm. you know. Um, and we, yeah, like Edge here and here doesn't sweat much between gigs. <laughs> Snoop Dogg doesn't sweat at all. Um, Lana Del Rey looks slightly tense and then slightly relaxed. And th this is Grimes. So, you know, Grimes mm. is the wife of Elon Musk. Yeah. Oh which, is, which is interesting. Um, I never they're also so, so young. I met her, so young. Amazing, really. Yeah. So, yeah, um, we've got some great names The Prodigy, mm. um, Rudimental, Primal Scream, wow. and Flying Lotus here. I really love this one. He was wringing out his t shirt with sweat mm. after it. And this is him just <laughs> getting ready for the gig, programming his laptop right before. Um, Paul Weller looks equally tense in both, wow. just a little sweatier afterwards. So, and Warpaint, they were amazing. I love them. So, a really lovely project mm. and with, that I had a lot of pride in. Um, uh, Muse, thankfully Muse, this was an interesting one. Oh man, this was so stressful. This was at Leeds Festival, headlining the Saturday night. Muse, one of the biggest bands in the world. Mm. We, we, we waited in position for five hours. It was cold, muddy and wet. Finally, at sort of two minutes to nine, just before the show, we saw their buggy like coming up this muddy path. And we we're like, oh, great, they're coming, they're coming, they're coming at last. <clears throat> they got out of the buggy. We we're like, hi, hi, hi. We, you know, you remember us? We're from Warchild. Great, thanks for doing this. And, and, and their tour manager started shouting at me because, <laughs> because the, the three steps to get into position were muddy. Oh, my God. And, <laughs> We're just like, they're a massive band. We know their following's really dedicated. We had mm. to get them. And it was like, well, he can't walk across there, can he? And, and I'd already said to the band, like, here's your mark. Please step across. Thanks so much. And then the tour manager was like, no, no, what, 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 wait, wait, wait. You can't have them walk across there. And I was like, I'm so sorry, because I knew they were all getting into position mm -hmm. and just tiptoeing across the mud. And I was like, I'm really sorry. Uh, uh, there's nothing I can do. I'll make sure it's sorted for the aftershot. Don't worry. And, um, just kept him talking while in my periphery they were getting in position thank god and not listening to their tour manager and very gracefully they gave us the shot that we really wanted mm. and again they just looked relaxed afterwards and thankfully the, there's a towel in there as well so that they could Amazing. at least look like you know because but basically muse do a two-hour headline sh headline shot at the biggest festival in the country well a very very big festival and um, don't sweat yeah <laughs> i mean it's it's really amazing. The the they really gave you a good a good performance there. I think mm -hmm. I, I once photographed them, and it was as a, it was an editorial for a music magazine. Oh, right. And you know, really often then they've got like I don't know, like ten appointments or may, maybe eight yeah. photo shoots a day. Yeah. And if you're like the unlucky one who gets like like the one like in the last third, basically, yeah. they couldn't care less. To be yeah, honest, so it, yeah. it was like in the recording studio. It was really difficult to actually oh, oh, to I'm get stressed. them to do basically like what you want. Yeah. yeah. But this is, I mean, it's a it's an amazing project here because it's it's incredibly dense and it's also very straightforward. Yeah. It's nothing, you know, where you need to, I don't know, let's say like uh, have an, an incredibly complex lighting no. location. Um, was this very much like, um, was it one of the first um, uh, portrait? I mean, let's yeah. say really it pure was. portrait shoots so the, for you. Yeah. So the, 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 this, I, did, I did this quite a long time ago and I, I thought it's quite, just quite interesting to um, talk about it today because it, w it was a vehicle for me. Mm. You know, it was it was a vehicle to test my skills, build my confidence, um, to transition sort of areas of photography, and to um, but, but also quite high profile names we were able to get. You know, so that that, that really really helped us um, both for the charity and the sort of sales element, but all, but also just move in those spaces. You know, mm. and I I. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really proud of the work. I'm really proud of the aesthetic. It was really, the aesthetic was really motivated by Annie Leibovitz's like 1971 Rolling Stone magazine work, you know, mm. which was obviously black and white film and was really, really just like clean and simple and just, mm. you know, ju 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 the, just the shots of the, where she was following on tour with Rolling Stones, you know, and I just thought just to strip away all the elements to simplicity and 
honest, a not really honest transaction was I could manage, I felt as though I could manage it, mm. you know. So, yeah, yeah it, that, that, that was why. And, and, and just how important it is to, um, you know, we probably slogged our guts out and I, and, and I, for this project. And I, and I say um, that, you know, you, you, you either exhaust the project or it exhausts you. Mm. And, and, and you know when it's over, you know, you know when you can't do any more and you just, you just feel as though um, the story has been told. You've answered mm. the question, you know. Yeah. And can you, are there some jobs that you can trace back to this project? Sometimes, for example, you do one, I'd say like a key piece of personal work mm. where you really know, okay, either that's going to have an impact or actually there's nothing else I can do, at least yeah. not in, in this part of my career. Can you trace back some, some commissions to particular piece yeah. of personal work? Yeah, I can actually. And it is, it's in the project section here and it's called Becoming a Father. And some people saw that project and uh, commissioned me to go and stay for a week in Lewisham Hospital in the birthing unit, waiting for, to try and get permission to photograph dads Mm. And, and, and who before and after having a baby so mm. th th this is the best example of it um it was a lot a lot of waiting a lot of hours down there <laughs> and but the tension of him here before having his baby and then coming to us mm. almost straight after having the baby and and the, the elation and relief mm. that they felt was lovely to pl apply the same concept to a completely different yeah. um, field. Ah, that's so clever, really. That's because yeah, it, it's true. It, you know, it follows a similar, a similar concept. Yeah, but yeah. obviously, like in a completely different, different yeah. environment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and and, and it, 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 it was really exciting, really exciting, and and you know, we we, we really felt yeah. it, really mm -hmm. felt it. I was very tearful. Yeah, very, 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 very tearful shooting this. Amazing. Oh Thanks. gosh, this is, this is lovely, really. <laughs> and what would you say the, when, we, when we had a chat uh, before the, yeah. the, the interview started, we were also talking about the relationship between um, self-doubt, uh, which can be a, a natural part of the creative process, yeah? And maybe some, to a certain degree, maybe, um, well, maybe self-doubt is the wrong term, but uh, self-criticism, yeah? Um, which probably is an important part of the uh, creative process, but then also on the other side, it must not really yeah. allow to actually hold you back. Yeah. Um, can we talk a little bit about that, I, about your opinion I, I here? Think, I think in 2020, it's really important to talk about mental health and it's all very well me, you know, possibly talking about how awesome my incredible career is. Uh, and it would be completely fake of me to not shine a light on the sort of dark patches that, that are, are involved in that process. And it, it would be irresponsible of me to do that. And for people to understand that, you know, it, well, not, maybe not everyone goes through that, but I know that I certainly do. And um, self-doubt is uh, something I suffer with. Every project that I put out, certainly, maybe not sort of single commissions, but certainly with projects and that horrible feeling of like, no one, you know, no one's going to like this, are they? No one's going to feel this, you know, no one's going to see it. Um, what's the point? And um, I think we, uh, it's important to acknowledge it, but for me, it's also quite a great motivator. And I, it's a voice in me and I think it's really important to say that sometimes nobody cares about whether Tom Oldham has self-doubt or not. Mm. You know, no, no, there isn't a one person in the world that thinks, I wonder if Tom Oldham is suffering any self-doubt with this project. And I think to acknowledge that and to put it out anyway, put your work out anyway, the, 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 there's no point in aiming for perfection with anything, mm. you know, just do the absolute best that you can until you reach a point and, and the more you do that, it's like a muscle. The more you flex that muscle of just thinking, you know, I don't want to swear, but just like screw it and put the work out and just mm. take it, whatever feedback you get, you know, um, it, it, the easier it gets and the more positive the experience gets and the 
And, I, and I'm terrible for focusing on the one negative aspect of any, anything that I do. And it really drags me down, that does. And for it to allow us to celebrate our successes, mm. it doesn't seem to be the English way, you know, and, and I think that's a terrible shame. So use self-doubt to think, screw it, just do it, put it out and hope for the best, you know. Mm. And um, th th that is my new sort of mantra with embracing my self-doubt and I don't want to get too self-help about mm, it because mm, I, I, I'm not really that guy but yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, to, to hear and acknowledge those voices and to think I'm going to do it anyway. Mm. Do you have a, um, an example maybe a series where you were I don't know maybe where the self-doubt um, were almost becoming so intense that you were almost scared to publish it and something mm. that ultimately actually Great. turned out to be a great, a great series and a great success? Great question, thank you. I do, uh, it's, it really flashed up then. But, so th th this is my project that I enjoyed loads of success with, um, The Last of the Crooners it's called, which is all of which was shot in the Palm Tree pub. Do you know the Palm Tree? Have you ever been to the Palm Tree? No. What do you do with your time? <laughs> Sorry, really, I, you tell me. You, well, we, we've got some time afterwards tonight, <laughs> really, so you can tell, take well, me to the Palm Tree pub. It is Friday night. Um, The Palm Tree Pub in Bow, for the last 41 years, every Friday, Saturday, Sunday night, has had crooners singing uh, from the jazz, the American book, Jazz Standards, um, uh, and really beautifully so. And, 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 and they're an aged group of um, players, very experienced, lovely to be around. It, it, this is not karaoke. This is really serious in lots mm -hmm. of ways. It's fun, but it's, it's, they're, they're dedicated players. And... Um, I've invested quite a few years in going to that pub and really wanted to document some of the performers and I finally got permission to do it and um, this does relate to the self-doubt self, uh, thing, mm -hmm. trust me, we will get, get around to that point. And I ended up doing, so it's not a documentary project, it's a portrait project, I only shot it over one and a half days and with quite a lot of organisation and expense, again self-funded, but um, the aesthetic of the pub is really, really unique. It's very, very dark in there. And all of this was shot on uh, Hasselblad, which is, you know, a, 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 a very, very beautiful camera, but you need for depth of field, you know, you really need mm -hmm. to, um, some light. Mm -hmm. So I took my team down on a Friday night and they uh, had a few drinks and got very much soaked in the atmosphere. And then we set about recreating that aesthetic on set and it was a really really lovely privilege to be given access i am astonishingly proud of the work but still wasn't sure if i wanted to enter it into any competitions and for the mere fact that you have to feel really robust about a project to face the rejection i think mm. so can i just just ask so yeah. these, these are these are actually staged like they are Oh, wow, that's because they, they look, I mean, so much in the moment, particularly like the musicians playing. Well, they, they, they were performing. They were mm. performing, but um, it, it wasn't for a live audience. It was for me um, shooting. Mm. So we, we did half of the day was portraits and then um, half of the day was portraits and then the, the evening was them performing and they all took it, took it in turns to perform. And uh, so it was done for the cameras, but... Um, that nevertheless they were actually, you know, creating music. So I don't, I don't know whether that makes it fake, mm -hmm. but um, you know, it's got a, a, an aesthetic I'm really, really proud of. But anyway, to get to the um, uh, self-doubt bit, it the, I, I got that email from the Sony uh, the Sony uh, Photography Awards, and that said, you know, you have 24 hours left to enter the Sony Prize, and I um, really, really considered not doing it because for the very fear of the rejection I would get and whether that would then lessen my love of the work, you know, mm -hmm. because the rejection, which is ridiculous in itself, but, you know, that's just how the brain works. And um, my brain works. And, but nevertheless, the, the whole house, my wife and children had gone to bed. I had an hour left and I drag and dropped 10 of these pictures into their bulk uploader, a few bashed out cheeky captions And it ended up winning the portrait, in the professional category, the portrait prize for the series. And 
you know, I want a really lovely camera and got a huge amount of publicity, live TV, radio, mm -hmm. loads of print and press. And we made a really lovely album. This is, oh, there's a short film there about it, but we made a, um, a vinyl rec album recording. And do you remember when you were little, you might have sat down and put an album on and then poured over the pictures on the album mm -hmm. sleeve. And that was a great motivator for creating the album and so that it could house all of the pictures in the work. There's a lovely booklet in it and, you know, contact me if you want one. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's a really, it's the nicest thing I've ever created for a project. It's really beautiful. But um, anyway, I, it, it was, we had a lovely launch event for it at the pub, but it, the, the main thing was having my work up at Somerset House and all of the PR and publicity that went with it. And I wasn't going to do it. I wasn't going to enter and I'm so glad I did. Mm. You know, it's really, it became really significant moment for me in my work. And mm. I never thought that was going to happen ever. You don't dare to dream with things like that. But we, 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 fortune favors the brave. You know, we've got to be more, um, we've got to be braver. We've got to be more robust with our work. Self-belief rather than self-doubt. And Mm. put it out there see what happens mm. you know yeah, yeah and i think also like in the creative process you can for example you can play it safe you can do something that you know is going to work and the question is in terms of the creative progress mm. how far is this going to going to take you and so for example if i do some personal work and and i try to you know try to explore something new and obviously it can really almost like excel my expectations mm -hmm. can be something really new something that really wows me or it can be just like utter rubbish to be honest yeah. so you really have to put yourself out there and i personally find it's just the maybe the first hours or maybe the day after the photo shoot it's also really difficult then to say okay did i actually achieve it is yeah. it something like for the bin basically or is it actually something where I made a creative quantum leap, yeah? yeah? So some of my best pieces where I would now look back and say like, okay, hey, these are my best pieces. I think I really messed it up after the photo shoot, yeah? So you really have to risk this kind of element, yeah? yeah. And you have to convert this into something positive, yeah? Definitely. Would you would you say in general that, that nowadays working with, working um, or um, participating in, in awards, Is that an important focus point for your career? No, no, not at all. And I, 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 you, you can't rely on it in any way at all. You, you know, the, the AOP awards are out, are, are, are hot at the moment. And I entered that and got absolutely nowhere, you know. Mm -hmm. Whereas I'm also the Sony World Open Photographer of the Year 2020, you know. So the, the, you, you, you can't... You know, You know, I, I do enter competitions because I think there are fewer and fewer outlets for quality mm -hmm. work and we can't rely on getting our work in magazines and, and our stories, putting our stories out there. It's really hard to do that. And just putting something on Instagram just isn't kind of enough, I don't think. And competitions for me are, I, I, I mean, I'm not wildly enthusiastic about paid for competitions. I think we often see a very similar aesthetic from quite a few of those and that I don't feel is very challenging always, but um, the Sony is free to enter, you yeah. know, and, and the benefits of getting, doing well in that are not inconsiderable because they have a massive PR team ready to get very excited about your work and you and what you do. And I'm um, permanently grateful for that. Mm. So um, my advice is give it a go. Mm. actually because you don't know what they're going to see yeah you can't help thinking that some of the photography exhibitions really became like some sort of like cash cows right definitely i mean you know like maybe a single picture entry sometimes it's 50 quid 60 much. 70 quid maybe a series 90 Nobody quid yeah that, do they? well i mean you know like the taylor west thing i don't know it's i think single is 50 series is 70 yeah i once checked it the they had like i think it was 10,000 submissions Do your maths, basically. So, Mr. Taylor and Mr. Wessing are making some, making a little fortune here, really. And well, no, I don't, mm. you know, in fairness to them, I don't. They are a legal firm. Mm. Um, yeah, I know. Uh, I don't think that they're, that they're sponsors. So, in mm. theory, they're putting money in as mm. also. Yeah, in theory. But, yeah, <laughs> but yeah. So you know, or let's say like the the um, uh, is that creative review. 
um, which ultimately just becomes another yeah, another magazine. Really, yeah. so I absolutely believe that that um, if you select the the right trophy yeah. competitions. Uh, it's an incredibly great opportunity, but yeah. they also seem to follow like the um, the way of the market. If yeah. there's a greater supply than demand, basically, then yeah. they can start to charge some money, I, basically. I, I, I really don't like the cash cow element mm. of it. And to approach the whole thing with a healthy cynicism, mm. I think is the only way. Yeah, with yeah. zero expectation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And but, 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 but it can be, it can really add up you know, financially, if you're entering a few of these things. So mm -hmm. just, uh, I, yeah, I don't, I don't know that you'll always necessarily see a return on that one. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. And particularly because you, you said at the beginning that you don't produce particularly like for photography awards. Yeah. No. I think it's great if you take those pictures anyway, and then on top of it, then you can submit them to an award. That yeah. means you would have done the same, um, the yeah. same, you know, let's say investment anyway, I yeah. guess. Yeah. yeah. Um, Good. I mean, fantastic. I mean, thank you so much. We've got uh, a few minutes for Q and A's. Uh, so everybody who has some questions, now's the time to ask these. Um, so we've got one question here from um, Russ Fowler who asks, uh, do you select your new, uh, how do you select your new project topic? So where do you get inspirations from? Just really quickly before we continue with this, um, quickly want to say that you need to log into your YouTube account if you actually have one, only then you can ask a question, something that we had to learn the hard way. So what would you say, where do you get inspirations from? Uh, how do you select your new project topics? Um, it's curiosity driven. So it's like, like, like I said before, and I don't want to rely on a sort of cliche for it, but it's like that question has to be answered with pictures. Mm. And you, if those pictures you can visualize and they excite you, um, then push forward. It, it, I, 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 I kind of feel like sometimes the projects choose me. Um, I, I did very briefly, I did, I, 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 this is one of the first things I did when I just got my first Hasselblad and I really wanted to investigate the sort of potential of this camera on location. And I went to, I, I was watching, oh, it's the 2012 Olympics, you know, and I, saw the uh, cycle racing at the velodrome in London and my, I phoned my cousin and went, who are those guys, like these chubby sort of dads that were riding these like motorbikes in front of the Kirin? And he said, oh, that, that, that's, you know, that, that's a uh, Derny driver. They're the Derny drivers. And they're, they're these lovely little 30cc yeah. motorbikes. So they set the pace and create a slipstream yeah. for, for the riders behind. And, and so if they're big and chunky, that's better. You know, and I was like, oh, my God, that just sounds, they're just like these sort of sexy old dudes, like, that are in Lycra, you know, like, riding around. And I was like, I, that's, that's just pictures, isn't it? That's the, I can see the pictures. So my cousin, Casper, is, is amazing. And he said, go down to, um, look at this guy, Tony. Um, he, he, he was in Pirates of the Caribbean, unsurprisingly. Um, I mean, that he generally was. And um he was like, go down to Herne Hill Velodrome, introduce yourself to this guy and, and see if they'll, they'll, they'll let you um, take pictures. And this brilliant thing that happens on projects when you're out there is that at first they don't want to be photographed, then they tolerate you, then they accept you, then they ignore you. And in that space where they're ignoring you is where the pictures live. Mm. And, and you keep going and they, they'd make an announcement and say, oh, by the way, this is Tom Oldham. He's going to be here annoying you with cameras all day. Please ignore him. Mm. And... Everyone would go, Ooh. and then they would. And, and you know, th this guy here is wearing, you know, like lycra, pink lycra with, with a sort of alien pod on his head. Mm. And that's not normal for me. Mm. I, don't, I don't see things like that. And I was just like, okay, and, and not asking them to pose, not doing anything, just like getting the shot of, of this other world. And, mm. and, and, and again, you know, you, you, and, and you shoot sort of portraits, you shoot action shots, you, you keep this, 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 sorry, to go back to this guy, his eyebrows, you know, everything about that image is, is screams pop, you know, positivity to me. And, and it's not my world, but because I've got a camera in my hand, it could be my world for a minute, you know, and I, 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 I'm, I it, it, this, you know, it's got a certain aesthetic to it, this, this project. And, 
I, 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 I'm really, really proud of it. And I love, I love the look and feel. And my, my, my good friend, Joe Digital, the retouch on this. And he um, really brought it home. So mm. anyway, how, how, you can have a little look at this shot just to explain. That's where a bike was left in the rain. And they oh, wow. kind of took the bike away. Amazing. And, and, and I, I just thought that's lovely, you mm -hmm. know, and I would, I'd never seen that if I hadn't put myself out there. So the most long-winded answer to your question imaginable, but it's like, you must see my enthusiasm for it. It mm -hmm. just, the, the projects kind of choose you and mm -hmm. you have this question in your mind that you just think, I've got to find the responses, the answers to that in picture format. And you shoot everything from little details to big wide shots. And then you suddenly feel like you've got it. And this was only four or five days of shooting, really, just going back after a few weeks, you know, and trying to get the seasons. But it, it it's, for some reason, it's always sort of sunny and sunny with fluffy clouds in, mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in Herne Hill. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We've got another question here uh, from Gina. Hi, Gina. Um, do you do additions when you give prints to the people that you take pictures of? Uh, so you give them a particular numbered edition? No. It's a great idea, though, but no. Mm -hmm. I'm not really, um, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about doing a print series of, of editions with some of the sort of better known people that I photograph, but I just, yeah, I need someone to come and organize it for me, mm. basically, but um, I uh, don't, no, it's a curious idea. I wonder why, Gina, you think I would do that? It's mm. interesting. I don't know if, mm. maybe you can message me after, maybe we yeah. can chat about that, yeah. but it, um, it's not really a requirement always, and We try to, I mean, I always honor my work when I am photographing people when they say, can I, can I have a print? But normally they just want a JPEG for their mm. social feeds. You know? I see, yeah, yeah. We've got another question from Camilo. He asks, um, do you think Instagram and smartphones are ruining photography? No. No, are you mad? Mm. Uh, no disrespect. I think the wonderful digital democracy that has occurred, you know, for photography for generations was owned by people like me, like middle-class, middle-aged men in seedy basements, you know, and they kept all the knowledge and the technology to themselves and were not keen to share it because they, 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 saw, they thought, thought they had ownership over that whole thing. And, you know, isn't it amazing that kids and teenagers and great grannies have got a camera with them mm -hmm. to document their lives and a platform to share their lives? I, I feel really passionately about the fact that there's this fairness in it for everyone now. And I, 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 you know, while not everyone can afford a Hasselblad, of course, it, like, it, it, you know, most people could get their hands on a camera in one format or another. And I think that's amazing. I think iPhones are brilliant. Mm. I love my iPhone, you know, and yeah, I'm going to be, I'm going to be producing something just shot on an iPhone, hopefully a, a film, uh, quite soon, just because of how good it is and how easy it is to use, you know, yeah. so yeah. I really believe in that. Yeah, it's true, it's very intuitive, you know, like the the uh, the layer between you and the shot is just yeah. getting thinner yeah. and thinner, and it used to be like the thickness of a Hasselblad, basically, or like a medium format camera, and now yeah. it's literally like the thickness of a phone, yeah. Yeah, and it's incredibly instantaneous and That's incredibly right. direct, That's and, true. And, and there's no financial, you know, mm. um, obstruction, I mean, there is, obviously, to, to shoot in quality, but, um, you know, most people can access a certain level of quality now, and that's great. Mm, yeah. Good. Thank you so much, Sweetie. Um, we're going to finish here. Um, thank you for watching, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming You're in welcome. tonight. Thanks. Yeah. Um, everybody who's watching this, you know you can uh, find our, um, our recordings on our webpage. If you go to www.liop.co.uk and then in the events and then the talk section.